Good evening and welcome to this evening's Lundy webinar. I'm Michael Williams and I'm Secretary of the Lundy Field Society. Tonight I'm going to be joined by Simon Dell, who will let us feast our eyes on a combination of historic and modern images as we travel through time uh, in his talk, Lundy Through Time. As you can see, I'm coming to you live from a virtual Morisco Tavern as usual this evening, uh, but in reality, I'm still at home uh, in Cambridge. On to the usual housekeeping uh, arrangements. If you're a regular viewer, then uh, do make yourself comfortable while I go through uh, these uh, regular announcements. We won't be able to see or hear any of you at home as only the microphones and video cameras on Simon's computer and my computer are enabled. As with all of these webinars, Dave Richards is behind the scenes hosting this Zoom session and we'll make a recording available afterwards and I'll uh, let you know how to find that and all of the previous webinars later on. If you are watching on Zoom, you can ask questions using the Q&A function just click the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen and then type your question into the box that pops up. If you're on a mobile or a tablet, then you can find it on the menu bar. Uh, and please do pop your question in at any time during uh, the talk this evening. There's also a chat feature for comments and feedback, which Dave and I will be monitoring during the talk. And if you're watching on YouTube, uh, I'm afraid there's no facility for you to ask questions. Okay, so moving swiftly on, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our speaker. Let's hope that Simon will appear on the screen. Hello there, Michael. Good evening. Hello, Simon. Good to have you here. Uh, now, many of you will remember that Simon joined me for our first webinar, which was very much a pilot back in April last year, which is almost a year ago. Uh, I must admit, I wouldn't have thought that we'd still be here uh, 12 months later, later and these talks would have uh, become such a success. In case you weren't there at the first webinar, I've got a short biographical introduction of Simon and then I'm going to hand over to him. Simon first visited Lundy when he was nine years old and has been returning regularly ever since. He has written three books about the island, including one entitled Lundy Through Time, and I have a copy here. Uh, and that's what this talk's based on. He regularly gives talks on a wide range of subjects from Lundy to policing in Devon, and he leads guided walks on Lundy and Dartmoor. So, Simon, thank you so much for coming to talk to us this evening. Uh, I'm going to hand over to you. Okay, that's very kind, Michael. Thanks for that very generous introduction. Good evening, folks. Uh, bear with me. I'll just share my screen and get my presentation uploaded. So won't be much a moment. There we are. Hopefully, that's uh, that's visible to you, Michael. Um, yeah, I can. That's that's good. That's great. Um, and what may be an idea is uh, just to assist the audio is to have my uh, image here uh, removed, uh, David, if you would, and then that will probably enhance uh, the microphone facility uh, my end in case of a poor signal. Thanks very much indeed. Good evening, folks. Thanks much indeed for inviting me along uh, again this evening uh, to give you a talk entitled Lundy Through Time. Uh, and Michael very generously mentioned the first book that I wrote about Lundy Island, which was Lundy Through Time. Um, and I think looking at old photographs of the island are absolutely gorgeous. I can lose myself in these sorts of photographs, even this introductory slide. I mean, look at that, isn't that nice? But I think what's especially nice about this image is, where's the, where's the south light? We know that the South Light was built in 18, uh, you know, in the 1890s, uh, 1896 into 1897 of being illuminated. So this is an image before 1897. Um, we're going to be hard pressed to get much before the 1850s, of course. Sometimes, what I will do, 
um, is my colleague. I'll just stop sharing and I'll move on to the slide. That will resolve the issue entirely. So bear with me just a moment. Simon, we're, we're already uh, having slight problems with your audio. Ah, okay. Do you want to go to a plan B? <laughs> yes, um, let, let, let's move on to plan B. So yep, uh, I'm... I'll stop sharing. Um, and there we are. Pause. So our plan B is that I'm going to share my screen uh, and uh, I'm going to show the slides and then Simon's going to talk to them. So yeah, I'm that's absolutely turn my, fine. Turn my video off and then I'll share my screen. Right. OK, Simon, when you let me know when you can see that. I can see that if you if you um, go on to the next slide, I've explained that one, go on to the next slide and hopefully yours will be live. That's fantastic, Michael. Thank you very much indeed. OK, uh, sorry about that glitch, folks. Stick with us and it'll be fine. Um, one of the oldest images, of course, of Lundy Island is this one, 1765, the John Dunn map. And when you look at this image, you think to yourself, that image is a map and doesn't look anything whatsoever like Lundy Island. Uh, actually, it was an image not drawn for terrestrial loose use. It was drawn for the purposes of people going around the island, looking at the island from uh, the sea. So that's why it's slightly different. If you look at it from the sea, it actually does work. Next slide, please, uh, Michael. This image, believe it or not, was um, a proposal for a building which was going to be built for Sir John Borlase Warren. This was going to be his mansion. You know, we all know what Mr. Heaven's or, uh, mansion looks like in Milcombe, but this is what Sir John Borlase Warren was intending to have built when he owned the island, and he wasn't even going to put it down near the landing bay. That was proposed to be going up near Gannett's Coombe, would you believe? Thank goodness that never came about. Next slide, please. I love this image here, this old uh, 1804 map um, at the top, and also um, a, a side view, an elevation of the island. Looking at the map from the top, it's not bad, you know, it's okay. Uh, looking at the side view, isn't that just identical to what we see now when we go across the Lundy Island on the Oldenburg? And this was drawn in 1804, and the significance of it is that there was an intention in 1804 to turn Lundy Island into a French prisoner of war uh, work depot, just like Dartmoor Prison was produced for. And this was part of the plans. But what is remarkable, just look at the top elevation, the map of Lundy Island, look where the landing stage is and look where the jetty was going to be built. That is pretty much identical to the current day 21st century jetty. How far sighted was that? 200 years ago. Well done, George Parkaris. Next slide, please. What I love about this image here is, OK, it's a beautiful painting. Um, it's actually the arrival of Sir John Borlase Warren with a seven gun salute from the ship there on the right hand side. Looks slightly left and you can just about make out the uh, the cutter um, rowing him ashore to Lundy Island to the, the beach. Have a look at that road there. Um, and you think to yourself, that is never the road going up to Lundy. Folks, please remember, this is before Trinity House got there, and Trinity House built the road that we now know and love going up, made of concrete. That is the old goat track. And you might even say to yourself, no, that's never the goat track. It's never that steep. Well, let's look at the next image, please, Michael. And we can certainly see what the goat track does, in fact, look like in an older image. Look down at the beach, start to come up the goat, uh, up the road, up to Seaview Cottage there in white. And that's where the goat track splits off going uphill steeply and where the current day old Trinity House Road goes <clears throat> around to Milcombe. Actually, it's not far off it, is it? Looking at the steepness of the goat track, and it is pretty steep, isn't it? Um, as you'll see from the next image, please, Michael, um, and you'll see that uh, the goat track is still there. Um, there is a faint scar on the horizon there, uh, going up steeply up towards, oh, that's great, thanks, Michael, um, going up towards the corner um, of the battlements there. Uh, the next slide also is of looking down the goat track. I'm on the goat track taking this picture, or rather, whoever took this picture was on the goat track, and that's how steep it was. Actually, this image here is one of my favorites because now look across there at the South Light. It's the South Light under construction. 
so therefore, Michael's there just en enhancing the, where the south light is. But have a look down below the south light at the cottages. And that's where the engineers stayed. Those of us that have been up there and had a look in that area, I'm, I'm amazed to think those cottages were stuck up there. They must have used blue tack or araldite or something like that. There's no massive ledge up there. Thank you. Next slide, please, Michael. And this is uh, an image taken of the South Light, looking from the probably the entrance of Benson's Cave, I should think. And this has got to be back in the 1950s period. Um, and so this is actually looking down um, where Christie's Key is. I think the key is there. Yes. So therefore it is around 1930s, 40s. Um, the steps coming down from the South Light coming onto the Lament Tree. I mean, they really are precarious enough uh, as they are without the landslides that took place in the late 20th, early 21st century. Uh, next slide, please, Michael, thank you. Looking down on the, the beach, this is a cracking image of one of what they refer to as the Tetty boats. There were three of them and they were flat bottomed sailing barges. Can you imagine coming across from Instow with goods and stores for Lundy Island in uh, the late 19th century into the early 20th century when this image was taken and um, when you look at this image, we've got this, I, I guess, a mindset saying, well, that, that's all the men, isn't it? That's the men who sailed her. And who was the owner? Well, I, I don't know what his name was. Actually, him, he was a she. And she is in this image and she has stood on the steps at the, the rear of the horse. Look to the rear of the right hand horse. And there's a little line of men and there's a lady standing on the steps at the bow of the ship. And that's the owner of these three tetty boats uh, who uh, supplied goods to Lundy Island. Next slide, please, Michael. Looking down from the lighthouse, down towards Christie's Quay, uh, you can see, and we're all, I guess, familiar, um, there's no jetty there yet. That didn't come until 1999, uh, but there's Christie's Quay, built by um, the Christie family from Tapley, uh, gardens, Tapley Park at Instow, uh, in 1922, uh, using labour from men who had come back from fighting uh, in uh, the First World War. And when you look at what modern day technology, technology is available, uh, that key side was built by uh, sweat and blisters and tears and probably a degree of blood. The next image, uh, please, Michael, will show the men who built Christie's Key, men who had not long since been back from the trenches and the horrors of the First World War. I guess what they had seen there was not, was uh, was significantly more than what they were seeing here with some significant hard labour there. So a real testimony as well to their labour that that building is still there. Uh, the key is still there protecting that little uh, landing stage. Next image, please. This gentleman here is the man who inspired me to go to Lundy Island. In the late 1960s, as a schoolboy, as I was at Appledore there in North Devon, I went across uh, from the Little Quay on the, uh, the Little Quayside School, and this was the man who my teacher introduced me to as the King of Lundy, Simon, said Miss Bats. It was, of course, this delightful uh, gentleman, uh, Mr Gade. And when I was nine years old, my head just about reached the belt on his coat. He was tremendously tall, of great stature, and also a great individual as well, compassionate, kind, a firm man, but he really was the grandfather of Lundy Island, standing by um, an artifact which is no longer there, unfortunately. That um, uh, notice there uh, on underneath his right hand was destroyed in 1954 when there was a landslide. That area there is very prone, as we know, to landslides. And in fact, over his left hand shoulder is the entrance to a once standing lime kiln uh, very near uh, the uh, the cave on the beach. Thanks, Michael. Next slide, please. A very similar shot of the TH stone, the Trinity House Landing Place stone, 1819, next door to that notice where Mr. Gade was standing. So that stone hasn't moved a, a long way. Um, when you look to the right-hand side of the picture, there's the little cave where the canoes are kept that we all know. So that's the location of where that lime kiln used to be back before 1954. The next slide, please, Michael. Uh, many of us, of course, will stay in the radio room. This isn't a picture of the interior of the radio room. Uh, it's actually one that was taken in the old light uh, because the, the, the old light was the original location for the, uh, 
the wireless that Mr. Gade used to use. Um, and there's Mr. Ogilvy, I think it is. Um, and Mr. Gade kept in contact with uh, Heartland Point Coast Guard uh, in nine o'clock in the morning and four o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, he was available to speak for emergencies and also for telegrams and orders and stalls and things like that. And so it's wonderful that that radio itself has been um, kept. Um, it's no longer working, of course, uh, but rather nice touch that uh, a, a VHF radio has been installed in the radio room, a receiver, not a transmitter, I've hastened to add. Next image, please, Michael. And here's Mr. Gade on the right hand side there, uh, along with uh, John Vickery on the left hand side and a little pony. And um, there is Mr. Gade's daughter, Mary. Um, known to many of us and a sad loss only a few years ago and uh, Mr Gade decided that he would rescue this pony and Mary told me many years ago that that pony um, actually was very rarely on four legs it was being treated very cruelly in a circus at Barnstable and Mr Gade really was a man of very uh, advanced thoughts about animal welfare and he bought it because it had been taught to stand on its back legs and he thought that was terrible so he bought it for Mary just as a pony so she could ride it. Well done Mr Gade I would say. Next image please. And there's an image that many of us that have been going to Lundy since the 60s, the 70s, 80s and 90s would be very familiar with, wouldn't we? Uh, there's one of the paddle steamers, whether it's the Waverley or not, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, but um, I think that that's very similar to how we, was, we were going across the Lundy Island in the 1960s. Next image, please, Michael. And there you think, what on earth is this image of? Can you see a... a, a a diagonal scar going across the skyline above Rat Island there. That's the um, the cord, the, the cable way from the south light going down to the very bottom left uh, to an anchor in the sea and halfway up it you can just about see above that vessel there is a, a cradle, uh, a gondola and that's what the Trinity House engineers used to put all the equipment in to winch up to the south light. The engineers themselves were forbidden to ride in it at any cost so uh, they just made sure they weren't caught doing so. Next image please Michael. And there we have uh, a very typical 1950s late 50s by the look of it image of the queues. Wow I'm sure many of us are familiar with the queues to get back onto uh, the Balmoral or the Waverley or even the Oldenburg in the early days um, and there's the jetty down the bottom end that's kind of how it was, folks. Uh, and this is obviously uh, some years ago because the light, the, the south light there is there with the original steps coming down the lament tree and eventually ending up down on the landing beach near the slipway. Next image, please. Here is Operation Beef, uh, which took place in the 1950s. It was decided by um, uh, Mr. Harmon that he no longer wanted to have beef cattle on the island. So they were transported off the island. Now, folks, tell me, how on earth do you transport a herd of beef cattle off Lundy Island? Uh, this is how you do it. You get uh, a former uh, Second World War uh, uh, amphibious warfare squadron uh, craft, uh, one of the ducks, and you drive them into the sea and up the ramp. Uh, the next image, Michael, uh, hopefully shows the, the, the bowels of this uh, vessel. Could you imagine being in there in rough weather? A flat-bottomed duck uh, amphibious vehicle uh, with no view of the horizon. I just dread to think what that must have been like, but it was successful and they got the cattle off to market onto the mainland. Next image, please. And there in the middle, I don't even need to tell you who Mr. Gade is there, standing head and shoulders above everybody else. And there are the cattle which he was preparing to uh, take off on that uh, amphibious vehicle. Next image, please. Down at the jetty, while we're still down on the, on the quayside there, there were a number of small buildings, these fishermen's palaces, uh, they called them. Uh, they were built by the fishermen from Padstow and also Senan Cove, um, in all, both in North Cornwall. Uh, when they came to Lundy during the fishing season, they would stay in these very rudimentary and basic structures and they called them fishing palaces. I was rather curious at why they picked up that name. I used to work all the way down in the Penwith area and talking to some of the fishermen down in Senan Cove, they said, well, we can tell you exactly why they're called fishing palaces because you know, our fathers and our grandfathers uh, had basements in all their cottages in Senan Cove. And that is where they smoked fish and they stored fish and they salted fish and they called the basements the fishing palaces. 
So these fishing palaces on Lundy Island are named after the basements of the Sen and Co fishermen all the way down uh, the other side, other side of St. Ives. Thanks, Michael. Next image. And there we have the Sheeran, so-called, because it was Mr. Sheeran that constructed this vessel. Uh, and that's looking from the side of the Oldenburg, no doubt. And this uh, vessel here, the Sheeran, the little, um, it's to a degree, I suppose I'm correct in saying it's amphibious. It did have wheels. It didn't power itself on land, um, but it was used for carrying stores and people from uh, the bigger vessels like the Waverley, the Oldenburg and the Balmoral, etc., to go to the landing beach. When it got to the landing beach, uh, people could walk down the front ramps and when it was time to store the vessel um, on the landing beach over at Christie's Quay or on the main landing beach there was a winch uh, which was operated quite often by Mr Davy and, and his successors and they would winch it up onto the beach on its wheels so that's why it had wheels. Next image please. As you come up the, um, the beach road um, up towards where the goat track comes off these are the two buildings now of course uh, this is a great place to see the Lundy cabbage uh, when I'm guiding on Lundy this is the first good look where people can stop where the little white cottage is there on the left hand side that sea view cottage uh, which was destroyed uh, in the 1960s and this um, little building on the right hand side there didn't last much longer either and there is now just a concrete slab there and I'm sure many people will be familiar with that concrete slab halfway up which is a great place for a breather coming up that interminably steep hill next image please and uh, when you come up the hill of course you're expecting to come around the corner and see Milcombe House or rather it was called the villa uh, built by Mr William Hudson Heaven in the 1830s when he bought Lundy Island and he had uh, the kitchen gardens now of course uh, taken on by the staff and looking very similar um, and it's nice to see them um, under um, cultivation. On the left hand side there, just beside the gates, uh, there was uh, a stable and also the uh, garage, shall I say, the shed uh, for Mr. Heaven's uh, coach, um, which I believe he actually had a coachman living on the island. Next slide, please. And in uh, Milcombe House now, of course, there is uh, that painting, uh, which is uh, hanging on the stairs, I think, on the, the stairwell uh, of uh, the Heaven family. Next slide, please. This is an image taken in 1958 on that very sharp bend by the gates of Milcombe House. If you look over to the right hand side there, you can just about make out the side of Mr. Albion Harmon there on the right, talking to Her Majesty the Queen Mother when she visited Lundy Island. There we are, there's Mr. Harmon and there's uh, the Queen Mother. And I know that in this image here, further to the right, uh, is um, Mr. Harmon's sister. Uh, Mrs. Jones there with the um, with the headscarf on on the far right, uh, assisting with teas. There we are. Thanks, Michael. Next slide, please. I mentioned about the fact that Mr. Um, Heaven had a coachman, and this is the cottage where he and his wife, the cook, lived. We now know this area, of course, as being Brambles East and Brambles West. Um, and this is the building that they lived in. The next slide, uh, please, Michael, will show them standing at the doorway of that building. I'm sure there will be some of you that might well remember from the 1960s, that building still standing and into the 1970s. Uh, but as the next slide I think will show uh, is that um, <clears throat> it was taken down uh, in very little time. Uh, it really was rotting away and uh, so the, the tractor and the chain pulled it down in about 15 minutes and I'm told it took about two hours with a sledgehammer to knock the chimney pot down. So that was when it was decided to knock that down and replace it with one other dwelling made of wood. This slide here, the next one, is another fishing palace which was converted into accommodation. Uh, we've got one of the lighthouse keepers there on the left hand side uh, from the south light and uh, this lady here, Miss Wilder G, and she had been a suffragette at the beginning of the 20th century, good on you, uh, Miss Wilder G, and she set herself up as what can only be described as an Edwardian childminder. She would look after people's children for the summer holiday and here are two girls that she's looking after. Oh my goodness, I do feel sorry for these girls. Uh, the stories that come about uh, from anecdotal and written information about Miss Wilder G, she used to take them down to the beach or rather send them down to the beach to wash at six o'clock in the morning naked. They would come back up, uh, have some breakfast, given a piece of chocolate for their lunch, do not come back until six o'clock. And there we are, 
Victorian and Edwardian childminding. I don't think Ofsted would allow that these days, but that now, of course, has been turned into and converted into Hanmer's, a lovely uh, piece of accommodation. And the next slide, please. As we come array around the corner from Hanmer's, we're now looking at the castle, and we all recognise the castle, don't we? And we've got Castle Keep Cottage there on the corner. Um, my goodness, it hasn't been extended yet, um, with that wonderful part of the building which has got the best view on Lundy, I always think. And so this was the original signal uh, building where the termination of the uh, telegraph signal station uh, communications came into. The castle here in the 1950s, I guess this image was taken, uh, dear Myrtle uh, passed me this image, I think, uh, the castle is, is looking very uh, tumble down. But look to the left on the castle parade ground itself, you can just see the pyramidical um, roof um, being circled there by Michael's arrow of a little building which was called the flag uh, building. And there's a flagpole there uh, where uh, the flags were kept in that building and uh, the flagpole was used to signal across to shipping coming past the south end of Lundy Island. Um, a huge percentage of shipping in the 19th century went past the end of Lundy Island and Myrtle told me that uh, in the very early days of her um, and her uh, husband going across to Lundy Island they used to stay in that building in bunk beds. How rudimentary is that? Uh, next slide please Michael. And here we have another view from the opposite direction. This is uh, looking with our back towards uh, the Devil's Lime Kiln. And you can see a slightly better view of that building at the base of the Lloyd Signal Station flag pole. Um, really a lovely view, I should think, without doubt. Next image, please. We've left uh, that image and we've gone down below the castle and there we can see the entrance of Benson's cave. Uh, not a cave washed out by the sea, I'd hasten to add, but probably a cave which we believe might have been dug out um, during the Civil War, possibly, or maybe a little bit earlier. The anecdotal information, um, could you please stay in the flag? <laughs> uh, I, you, yes, you could stay in the flag uh, pole house in the 1970s. Thanks indeed for that uh, little message that came through from Lisa. Um, and here we have Benson's Cave. Possibly, anecdotally, uh, it is said that it was used to hide one of the royal mints, which uh, King Charles I in that um, 1644 period uh, hid one of his royal mints under Lundy Island's castle, they say. Next slide, please. And here we have an interior shot of the interior of the castle uh, with uh, some members of the staff and also the family of um, the, the Reverend Heaven. Uh, looking on the right there on the steps, the little girl there on the far right, uh, that is Sylvia Heaven. Um, and more of her a little later on, if you could perhaps put that little image in your mind's eye standing on the steps coming out of the castle. And the next image, please, Michael is of another building just by the castle. This is where I would remember, of course, where Mr. Dyke, um, uh, John Dyke and um, Joan lived, and of course, Jilly um, in those early years. And this, these are signal cottages. They were eventually pulled down uh, by the Landmark Trust. It was decided, um, obviously a difficult decision to take, but Mr. Smith decided that he would like all the other buildings near the castle uh, raised to the ground in order to make the castle the most prominent feature on that headland on Lundy Island. Next slide, please. Here we have, of course, Mr. Alday, the postman um, in Lundy Island around that First World War period. I've got an idea, I'm sure later on Michael might confirm it, that Mr. Alday's daughter, I think, was the first young lady to be married in St. Helen's Church. But I'll, I will possibly come back to that question a little later on. And here we have his means of transport with his somewhat recalcitrant donkey. I'm told that the donkey would not carry the bags. Um, he's got a lovely photograph here of, of the bags, but he ended up walking next to his donkey carrying the bags himself. Next image please Michael, thank you. And there's Mr Alday um, outside of the Lundy Island post office which was up at the Signal Cottages. Um, also I've heard all sorts of tales about dear Mr Alday, he used to go through the post to make sure that it was acceptable uh, to be read by the islanders. And so when you look at these cottages, um, and people often say what happened to the bricks from the buildings that were demolished, they were actually put into a huge great big 
um, Stone Crusher. Many of you, I'm sure, have been up to the Black Shed. They've walked out towards the helicopter and you've wondered to yourself, what on earth is that great big iron structure with huge wheels? That's the old Stone Crusher. And so all these buildings were crushed up for aggregate, for ground, uh, for road building and stuff like that. So nothing was wasted. Nothing was pushed over the cliffs, I can assure you. It was all reused by Landmark Trust. Uh, next image, please, Michael. And here we have what we call, I suppose, is the rocket pole shed opposite the shop um, up at the lemon tree uh, where the little displays um, this display is. Now, it was the shed where the equipment for the Coast Guard was kept. And here we have the Coast Guard uh, rescue equipment being brought out uh, by the horses. I'm always puzzled by this picture, you know. Look at the left of the picture. Can you see the window? How on earth is there the legs of a man coming out of the window uh, on the left of the image of this uh, building? That's rather curious to me. Next image, please, Michael. And there are the members of the, uh, the Lundy Island Coast Guard uh, at the end of the 19th century. Um, and the next image, please, Michael, possibly shows um, the sort of work they were doing. And um, this image here shows the Mariah Kariakides. And the next image, please, Michael, shows the use of the breeches boy equipment and the Greek, I think they were, uh, crew that came off uh, that ship. Uh, the next image, please, uh, also shows the use of the Breaches Boy equipment. Breaches Boys were still being used um, in the 1980s when I was stationed on the Lizard. We were still using Breaches Boys for rescues. Um, and this does bring back some very, very emotive memories uh, for myself personally. But thank goodness, not one member of the crew were lost during that tragedy. Next, next uh, slide, please, Michael. And here we have another well, tragedy, I guess, for the Royal Navy. And here we have HMS Montague in 1906. What a bridge. Could you imagine walking across uh, from uh, the top of the Montague steps, which weren't there then, I'd hasten to add, uh, going across there. We've got a very stalwart young uh, Edwardian lady there going across that bridge in her white dress. And that vessel remained there, stuck fast for about 20 years while they were salvaging it and getting off as much stuff as possible. Um, it took 20 years to salvage the ship, but I think it took less than 20 minutes to wreck the career of the captain. Next slide, please. And here we have um, the bottom of the Montague Steps. People have this erroneous thought that the Montague Steps are connected with HMS Montague. That is not correct. They're simply called Montague Steps because they <coughs> were carved and built into the rock um, very close to where the Montague came to grief near Shutter Rock. And these were built after 1909 when there was a great landslip which washed away and swept away Pilot's Key in that area. And these men are at the the, the very bottom of the ladders of Montague Steps. Next slide, please. Um, and there we have a modern day photograph of the Montague Steps. Um, I have taken people down there. I actually no longer do that because I, I don't feel confident to take uh, people down there, but uh, it is possible in the right conditions. I wouldn't recommend going down it by yourself. Make sure you're with somebody and make sure it is extremely calm. Uh, if you ever do venture there, it is not for the vertiginous at all. Next slide. We now made our way up to the, uh, the, the old light um, and the old light building. And these are part of the plans uh, from Trinity House. And you can just about see the top right hand corner of this image shows a side uh, section of the, uh, the lower light, which was underneath that peak um, halfway up the lighthouse. Uh, when it was decided the lower light and the top light really became one light at a distance out to sea, they decided to lower the lower light right to the very ground floor and they built that building, which I guess you could reasonably say looks more like a conservatory at the bottom there, which has recently been restored, thank goodness, uh, by Landmark. Uh, next image, please. And when you look at this image, that's probably a, a slightly clearer image of where the, the lower light used to be with the peak sticking out on the left hand side, halfway up the lighthouse uh, itself. But look over way to the right there and you can see a lone cottage all by itself. And that was demolished around the 1896-1897 period when the North and the South Lights were taken into use. And a lot of the material from that cottage, which used to be the principal keeper's cottage, was also uh, re-loved and reused um, and recycled into the church, uh, which was built um, in the 1896 period. Next slide, uh, next image, please.
And associated with the old light, of course, is the, um, the, the, the battery. Um, and um, going down the zigzag line there, the walls are painted white, so it's easy to see them. And there's the cottages at the bottom, or rather, well, cottage, bungalow, I'm not sure what we want to call it, really. Uh, a, a pair of semi-detached single-storey buildings with a central chimney. And further down, of course, the next slide uh, will show that uh, there was a little um, curved, galvanised roofed uh, building where the two cannon uh, were kept. Uh, one of them was inside, pointing out to seaward to be fired um, in the event of fog, and the signals were sent off every five or ten minutes uh, throughout the period. And that period of fog could last for quite a long time. It must have been a very noisy place to live, I can assure you. Uh, next slide, please. And as we uh, get right at the very north end, uh, Lighthouse. Um, it's, it's interesting to note that the south light was built from granite from uh, the uh, rocket pole pond on the south end of the island. That was a quarry pond. For the north light, which is where we are here, they didn't need to have a quarry. What they actually did was they uh, used dynamite to blow up the pyramidical granite rock where the new lighthouse was going to be built, and they reused the subsequent granite for the construction of the lighthouse. And there we have, in a very similar uh, situation, the accommodation buildings, uh, which were constructed on that big concrete slab that you walk onto now if you're going down to the North Light. And you can just about see where the North Light is now situated with that, where that great big pile of granite is located. And the next slide, please. And that north light, as we can see here from this picture here, which might have been taken between the two walls, I guess, um, shows the tramway, which comes out from the, uh, the north light going out to the standoff, to the winch, to the derrick, and to the cableway going down into the sea. So the next image, uh, hopefully, uh, will show that at the very bottom of the steps um, of the, uh, the north light standoff is where the lighthouse keepers uh, were. Uh, landed. They didn't go up uh, onto the mainland and get driven up uh, to, like they do today, of course. The engineers, uh, they used to land there and walk up those steps. And if any of you have walked up those steps, you know what it's like. The next image, please. And we'll now start walking south again, um, back to the village. Uh, we're coming past Tibbets, and here's Tibbets, and that's what it sort of looked like uh, back in the 1940s, the 50s, uh, with the lookout on the top um, of the, the building that was taken down by the Landmark Trust. And of course, that circular wall was built around uh, you. They say you can pick uh, mushrooms in your pajamas in September there and not be seen by anybody two miles north of the village. Next image, please. And that's what uh, Tibbets was all about. It was a signal station constructed just prior to the First World War for the Admiralty uh, as a signal station. Um, and it probably did a very good job, uh, very high up. It's actually built on the second highest point of the island. The highest point is Beacon Hill, where the old light is constructed. And the next image, please, uh, Michael, shows some of the crew, the Admiralty crew and their mascot, by the look of it, who were stationed at Tibbets. Uh, keeping a good lookout and look at the size of that um, telescope there that the guy on the right is uh, is holding. And the next image, please. Coming south, of course, in the Second World War, we know that there were a number of crashed aircraft on the island. Perhaps the most well known and the most famous was the Heinkel uh, 111 bomber aircraft, uh, which came down in 1942. It made a forced landing rather than a crash landing, and all six members of the crew survived it, um, and they became prisoners of war and went across to Canada, uh, where they spent the rest of their war. And the remains of that aircraft, uh, there's a few images um, with uh, Mr. Guppy, the lighthouse keeper, on them. Uh, but the next image, please, Michael, uh, will show uh, the sort of quantity of uh, stuff that was left behind. I guess the image, image I think this might have been um, um, one of the images taken by Derek Sage back in the 50s and the 60s, possibly. Um, you can see a few bits and pieces there that I'm sure some people will recognize. Uh, but nowadays, uh, the next image, I think, um, is, um, oh no, it, it, I, it's now modern. It's not much left of it at all, actually. Uh, but when people do go across, don't go picking anything up. Leave it as it is. Otherwise, it's not going to be anything there at all. The next image is of the aircraft um, that were used in the time. Um, I won't insult your intelligence by telling you which one Mr. Gade is, of course. There he is. Um, and and the aircraft were being used from 1929 onwards for transporting uh, sometimes uh, people flying in from Rafton Airdrome or RAF Chivna to you and me, uh, and also, of course, the post um, that 
uh, Mr. Martin Coles Harmon, the postal system that he set up in 1929. And the next image, uh, please, is coming even further south towards the quarries. Here we have an image from the late the Victorian period of the quarries. Um, the quarries were in operation around the 1860s. There was an attempt um, some decades later to reopen them, and it never did come to anything. Um, and this is the image of the big quarry. Uh, this is not VC quarry. This is the one slightly further north, the much bigger one. Uh, the next image um, <coughs> is of some of the accommodation um, for the quarry manager, uh, the doctor, and the accountant on the island. Um, and it's very much, isn't it, very much of what it looks like now, of course. Uh, okay, the building in the middle has lost its lintel because that's now in government house but pretty much as it stands now next image please michael well, as we come a little bit further south also to do with the quarrying is the timekeeper's cottage of course now a memorial uh, to mr gade uh, our good friend uh, and the little clock hole there where the clock used to be is now a slate with a memorial to mr gade and um, many of you who will have been to into this building over the last maybe two years i think it is or maybe three years now uh, the boys brigade uh, lads uh, guys now of course gentlemen uh, have put some cracking seats in there uh, some bench seats so they've done a wonderful job if any of them are listening to this talk tonight thank you very much indeed for all you do on lundy island uh, the next image, uh, please, um, shows VC Quarry, and there on the left-hand side is Mr. Martin Coles Harmon, and his son, John Pennington Harmon, was killed at the Battle of Kohima on Easter Sunday in uh, 1944, and um, Mr. Uh, Harmon uh, invited the commanding officer, who was present at the time of his son's death when he won the Vic Victoria Cross posthumously, and the gentleman there in military uniform um, on the left-hand side next to Mr. Harmon is his son's commanding officer who was present at that time. Uh, the next slide, uh, please, Michael, shows Mr. Martin Coles Harmon with Mr. Albion Harmon there pointing out the memorial to his older brother. He's pointing it out to his son and his daughter, a memorial to a very brave young man. Next slide, please. I guess we can't really sort of finish the talk unless we do look at the village. Here's a, a bird's eye view from the top of uh, St. Helen's Church Tower, looking towards the uh, the Manor House Hotel. Uh, and wow, the island when this image was taken during the time of the, the Harmons, uh, it, it was in need of TLC. The Second World War had a, a, a very significant effect on the uh, economy of Lundy Island um, and something really needed to be done. Um, and really, it was the Landmark Trust who came along in the late 1960s, in 1969, and turned the fortunes of Lundy Island around completely. Next image, please, Michael. Um, and this image here, again, shows the island village. Uh, in the distance, on the left, you can see the old light. Hang on a minute. Where's the church? Uh, it hasn't yet been built. So therefore, we do know that this image was taken uh, prior to 1896. Uh, the original plan was that the church was to be built and there was going to be a, a vicarage, a rectory next to it. Uh, and when you look at the plan of the, um, the freehold property on Lundy Island, uh, that land is still owned uh, by the ecclesiastical authority and it's big enough to build a building next to it. And that was the original plan, but that never did come to fruition. But what has happened to Lundy Island and the church, uh, St. Helens, is a wonderful story, a very wonderful modern story. Next slide, please, Michael. The original church, Mr. or rather the Reverend uh, Hudson Grosset Heaven, wanted to build a church to the glory of God. Um, his first church was this building. They called it the Ironry. Now, it's very difficult to kind of work out where this building is located. It's actually located at the rear of Government, government House. Imagine if you would come from the, the Morisco Tavern and walk as if you're going down towards Milcombe House and go through the Blue Gate, the Priest's Gate, or the gate to the back of Milk of uh, Government House. Go through that gate, and on the left, there's a little quarry where there are some starling, um, some sparrow boxes, uh, and there's a little iron railing going down beside the quarry. You can see the iron railing in this picture. That little ironry church, thanks, Michael, is built in the back of the quarry where there are now trees and willows, uh, which is a little wildlife haven behind Government House. And the next image, uh, please, Michael. Uh, shows um, in, I guess, 1895, 1896, St. Helen's Church under construction. Um, and the next image, 
uh, will no doubt show a little bit more of the construction of uh, St. Helen's Church. And I think these images are wonderful because, OK, we're, we're talking about St. Helen's Church, but look way to the right and you can see Barton Cottages there up where the staff live. Um, look at that. They've got apex roofs. Now, of course, they're flat roofed. If you come down to the building of the old school, we call it the Blue Bung uh, on the right hand side, uh, Michael's showing it there. Um, that was the schoolhouse. And then as you slide uh, to the left, um, you can see the two buildings, which were um, barns, uh, cattle sheds. Um, and there, that is now uh, Big St. John's and Little St. John's as well. And the wall, when you look at the wall coming around um, of that area, it's been significantly repaired, of course, uh, over the years, uh, which is wonderful. Next image, please, Michael. And when you look inside the church, uh, this is before the great storm which took place. Uh, the year has gone out my head. I think it was possibly in the 1960s um, when the top of the stained glass window above the altar was blown out. And many of us will remember, of course, that it was blocked up. But nowadays, of course, that's been opened up again. And uh, Matt, the stonemason with his colleagues, have done a wonderful job at restoring that stained glass um, window to, to uh, the glory of God, I'll say. Next image, please, Michael. And here we have uh, the occasion of Tom Granger's confirmation. Uh, Mr. Granger, the island uh, manager there at the back, uh, the, the agent, along with the bishop um, there in his mitre who performed the um, uh, the confirmation. Uh, way over on the right-hand side, you see that lady there with the boots and the raincoat? That's Sylvia Heaven. We saw her picture uh, as a little girl in the, uh, the quadrangle of the castle a little while ago, didn't we? And way to the left is the Reverend Donald Peyton Jones, who I remember very well from my school days in Appledore, where he was our vicar. What a character. Uh, he, it would take another 45 minutes to give you my, uh, my thoughts about that good, decent uh, Christian man. Well done. Um, and the next image, please. And there she is on the right-hand side there, uh, Sylvia Heaven, if you forgot what the image looked like. And the next image, please, Michael. Thank you. And there, the last few images, there's the front of the uh, Manor House Hotel. Um, and it's a bit of a set up picture. And I love this one because, of course, there is, I know, a modern day picture as well um, on the island of the current day staff. What is nice about this picture, um, if Michael is able to, can you pick out the bay window um, just on the left hand side there? That's that's exactly the one, Michael. Thank you. That has been relocated into the current day Morisco Tavern, you know, in the bar where the big round table is often occupied by the staff. There's a big bay window there. That is the window, that's where it came from, uh, at the end of that building there. Next image, please. And here we have uh, what we now know, of course, as the Morisco Tavern, originally built for the quarry workers, uh, but we've got the post office, the stores uh, for the island in that building. And the way it looks now is very, very similar. Obviously, the interior has been completely redesigned. And the next image, please, Michael will show the interior of that uh, that image. Uh, the gentleman here, uh, the barman, is standing uh, pretty much where table number one is. Uh, just behind him over his left shoulder, that's where the door to the wheelhouse is nowadays. And so that's where the, the food servery is located. And the next image, please. And looking in the opposite direction, up towards the bar, um, that's now been knocked through, of course, and you can walk through into the tavern area, shall I call it, uh, and this is the area where the food is served. Uh, quite often occupied by lighthouse keepers, by the look of it, on the left-hand side, uh, and I don't blame them. And the next image, uh, please. And there's the back of the tavern. Um, I think this image here was taken from pretty much standing by the current day um, radio room looking at towards the uh, the doorway of uh, the old house north and south and the next image please and there we have another older image of the linnae which is where the shop is occupied now over on the right hand side there's the barn and on the left there that well that's the fire engine station isn't it as we all know but i love social pictures social images and can you make out the children there standing by the wheel of that hay cart there i think that's a lovely piece of social history and the next image please and there we have uh, barton cottages uh, the landmark trust um, have restored them very significantly. They now have flat roofs. And um, this is the high street, um, an, an image taken in the 1950s. Um, and it really uh, was falling apart, wasn't it? And the next image, please. 
and looking in the opposite direction back down the the, the, the village uh, main road down towards the uh, the the barn area uh, showing the ruins of the Barton cottages next image please and there's another image there um, and Myrtle told me that they used to uh, set the tables up there uh, this is where the shop is now when they knew a ship was coming in and they would serve in excess during the whole day of almost a thousand cups of tea and coffee on those tables there what a what a herculean effort by the ladies and everybody you know stripped their sleeves and and uh, got stuck in uh to, to no exception uh diana was there as well uh, so myrtle said helping as much as possible with all the staff and uh, anybody and everybody helped out next image please uh, archaeology has taken place on the island, of course, um, and some significant books have been written about uh, the islander, the other uh, island. Uh, Keith, um, the, a well-known archaeologist, uh, did a, quite a good volume on the archaeology, and this is at the back of uh, where you would know where the, the generators are, uh, the next field on from where the, the camping field is, um, of a building. They think possibly maybe the remains of the stronghold of Morisco himself. Not sure, uh, but there's a possibility. And the next image, um, <coughs> please, uh, is a landmark trust era image where we've got um, uh, the quarters, uh, which were put up there in the 1970s um, as prefabricated buildings, not intending to be there forever, but my goodness me, they are, they're there forever, I think, and good accommodation they are. Um, Barton's has got flat roofs now, of course. Uh, it looks like the steps of the, um, the uh, barn have been completed, um, and so a much more modern image there in the 1970s going towards the 1980s, I would imagine. And the next image, please. And uh, a few last images looking from the top of the, the church tower. Uh, black Shed is no longer there, ready to have the new Black Shed built. Um, I, I call that image their work in progress. Um, and when you look at it, what is interesting, the road going up to the village goes over a cattle grid now, doesn't it? Um, and look at that, you used to go through a gate and the walls have a very different look to them as well. There was a wall coming all the way up past uh, where the tennis courts were. Um, up towards Manor House uh, Hotel, a very different layout of the walls entirely. Uh, next image, please. And uh, last couple of shots there, all the black sheds been built. Um, and again, a work in progress. Uh, have a look at where the camping field is now. Uh, right at the very back, the, the tents there are hunkering down out of the southwest wind uh, by the look of it. And looking at the Manor House Hotel, pretty much where Square Cottage is now. There's a chute there uh, with all the debris uh, to be coming out uh, with a trailer underneath it, no doubt. Next image, please. And that's about it, folks. Thank you very much indeed for sharing a quick nip around Lundy Island with some older photographs. Uh, that's about a quarter of my collection and about half of what appears in that Lundy Through Time image. Um, the original uh, first volume of Lundy Through Time uh, had a nice image at the bottom and uh, this second uh, edition has this image and there we have the pupils from Chumley Secondary, uh, Chumley Community College taken about I think 20 years ago. My goodness time does fly a bit uh, but thank you very much indeed. What I'll do now is I will stop sharing uh, oh no you stop sharing your screen Michael it's sharing Simon <laughs> thank, you. thank you so much Simon that's been that's been absolutely fantastic uh, I'm hoping that we can yeah we can make you reappear on screen excellent thank you very much for bailing me out with the uh, the slide show I think that worked okay Michael it I think works, it worked I think it worked it certainly was working fine from my end uh, uh, we, we when we were preparing before we went uh, live uh, about an hour ago we realized that Simon was having some connectivity problems so we did we did prepare a backup plan and uh, that's the first time we've actually had to use the backup plan so <laughs> it works well done yeah, so um, please do uh, put your questions in the Q&A. Because I've been uh, navigating the slideshow, I've not been able to uh, read any of the questions in advance, so uh, I just need to catch myself up slightly. There's been some lovely comments coming up, which I'm very grateful for, um, and a few I've kind of answered as we've come along and I've noticed them, so thanks for everybody's interest in that respect. Great, great. So... Uh... Let's go to Liza Cole first. Uh, Liza is asking when and why did people start calling the old jetty Christie's Key? Uh, she, uh, Liza's never heard it called that until fairly recently. 
Okay, well, that's that's really interesting. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, Lisa, um, you you've been there, you know, for some time. Um, I think it is a fairly modern thing. I th I don't know of a date, to be honest. I think it is in the times of the Landmark Trust. Uh, it was built by Mr. Christie, of course, in 1922. I think it was, um, as I explained. And I, I guess really, it has been done. Perhaps not that I've ever been told. The logical thing is to say it's been done because it's clearly needs a name to it because there's, there is another key side I suppose the jetty now that's Christie's key uh, built by Mr Christie uh, after the first world war so I don't know of any specific reason but it's one of those things Lundy gets names for things doesn't it absolutely um, I'm just going to pick up some of the comments in the chat um... Uh, I'm sorry to uh, to to, to uh, Viv Bennett. Uh, we weren't able to show Simon's video because we were we were because of his connectivity problems. So uh, I'm sorry that you weren't able to see Simon when he was oh, talking. No, you didn't know when I was swigging from the uh, available from Biddeford Pottery. Uh, Miss Juniper does a wonderful job. Well done if you're watching. <laughs> Uh, oh, you, you mentioned about uh, Mr. Alday, didn't you? So uh, uh, Alan, Alan Rowland has commented that uh, uh, William Thomas married Mildred Dorothy Hannah Alday on the 6th of February 1916, which is marriage record number one. There we are. I, that rung a bell in 1916, rung a bell as well. Thanks for that, Alan. Very grateful to you as always. My, the interesting fact which I always remember about Mr. Alday is the fact that uh, he... He came to Lundy as the Lloyd Signalman in, uh, I think it was 1896 or something like that. Uh, and then he had to he had to go and visit the doctor at some point. Uh, and I think this was in 1920 or something like that. And he had not left the island in the intervening period. So he lived continuously on Lundy for 24 years before he visited the mainland. I there think it's are. just remarkable. Perhaps you didn't like sailing on boats or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Quite possibly. An <laughs> early days, uh, Mr. Gade. Uh, Robin Hall. Hello, Robin. Uh, Robin says, interesting to hear, if I understood Simon correctly, that the Montague steps are not related to the salvage effort. Uh, is it known why they were chiselled out? Possibly a landing site. Yeah, we know that when there's an easterly gale on Lundy Island, uh, we know that the Oldenburg is not going to do that. Years ago, of course, they would go around to the west side and you come off on Pyramid Rock. But in that area of Montague Steps, uh, there was slightly to the north Pilot's Key, which is where, in the event of an easterly gale, the pilots of Trinity House could be dropped off in safety in the lee of an easterly gale at Pilot's Key. That Pilot's Key was destroyed by a landslide. I believe it was 1909. That's the date that's sticking in my head. And when that happened, there was no safe west side landing for the pilots to be dropped off. That is the reason why the Montague steps were constructed for that purpose to get people off vessels on that westerly side. So no, they were nothing to do with the salvage operations. At the top of Montague steps, many of you who have been there perhaps will know that there are six still, six big iron stanchions, which were used to secure that cable way across to the ship. So they are there, and it's only coincidental that the steps are in that area. They're not connected. Um, I think I, 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 I heard recently that the Montague has been scheduled and the steps have been scheduled with it, but I think that's a bit erroneous. Uh, they aren't actually connected with it. I hope that answers your question, Robin. Uh, we've got a couple of comments about camping. So Stephen Hubbard says uh, that uh, one used to camp in the field to the left of the black shed. So presumably that's the field where the helicopter lands. I'm with you. Yes. Yeah. OK. That, that's before my time of six, the 60s, I would imagine. I mean, that, that field is called the tent field, isn't it? So yes. I wonder whether yeah. that, that, that is the camping connection. That surprise me. Yeah. yeah. All right. You are. Um, Roger Starr says uh, that he's a scouter from near Bristol and he's been told that some scout groups uh, camped there regularly between the wars. OK, yeah, I've, I've heard uh, that that is the case. Um, a, a lot of stuff going on. And of course, the Boys Brigade guys as well um, over the, the decades have been camping there as well, haven't they? Let's move on to a question from David Can. Uh, David asks, do you have any pictures of the north end showing the vegetation before the fire? 
Okay, they are very rare. I do not have any. Um, the great fire at the North End uh, was, um, I forgot the year, the early days of the, the, the Harmons. Um, and, I have uh, 1934 in my mind, but I, I'm not sure whether that, that's yeah, correct. Somebody will push me to it. I'd have said, yeah, before the Second World War, Mr. Harmon came in the nineteen yeah, mid-1920s. Uh, so, no, I don't know of any. I'd love to see some. Um, because, but then you know, there was a benefit. It uncovered a lot of archaeology, uh, that, that fire, which destroyed a lot of the peat there. But no, I've not got any, and I've not seen any. Uh, maybe the question could be asked of Alan uh, Rowlands, perhaps. He might have seen some, maybe. Uh, yeah, Alan, if you, if you want to drop something in the, in the comments, then uh, please do. Uh, but it, me, this, it leads very nicely into a question, because we've been talking about the fire, from Mike Jeffrey. He asks, uh, what is the situation now with regards to fire cover? Do they have a modern pump and crew to man it? Oh, yeah, yeah, no problem at all. Uh, there is a, fire, a formal fire station on Lundy Island. They have equipment there um, and there is a trained retained firefighting crew, uh, both uh, lads and the girls there from the um, the staff are part of the Coast Guard and also the Devon Fire and Somerset Fire and Rescue Team. Uh, so they're trained regularly, they're equipped the same as firefighters uh, with one special added uh, um, skill which is important and that is uh, for the helicopter days. Uh, they're also trained in uh, the event of a fire there concerning aviation fuel which is a very different thing to deal with entirely. So they're highly trained and well equipped and very competent indeed. Thank you, Simon. Uh, we've got a few, just a uh, few comments, uh, a few more comments. Bob Bugatti says, excellent talk. Thank you, Simon. Thanks, Bob. Sally Jenkinson, thank you so much. What a fascinating talk and amazing photos. Great. I'm glad you enjoyed uh, them. Thank you. Barry Disney says thank you as well, and he can't wait to get back in November. Well done. Correct answer. I'll be there in the radio room in November. So if I'm if I'm there at the beginning of November, I, you can buy me a pint. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go back to the questions. Uh, Brian Woodcock. Uh, hello, Brian. Uh, many thanks, Simon. Super talk with photos we haven't seen before. Good. The aerial shot of quarters. What happened to the small row of buildings just to the north? Uh, uh, what was this? To the, just to the north by the camp field. Okay, I'm, I'm not entirely sure which buildings you're referring to there. Uh, can we work it out by, by the text he's put there? Um, north of quarters, there are two rows in quarters, the bigger row at the front, the smaller row at the back. You've got the modern day camping field behind. You've also got now an enclosure which has been, shell which has been roofed over for the JCP and the engineers workshops and the generators. Um, I'm not sure I know about any buildings in so Simon, if I if I show the slide again, I think it may be the ah. Shippen's building. So I've got the ah, slide. Okay. Well, that'd be useful. Thank you. Um, so perhaps oh, uh, we're talking about case, these buildings here. Yeah, if that is what um, the inquiry was referring to, your arrow there, Michael, is showing where now you've got the big arched entrance to the covered over yard where the tractors, the JCB uh, and the quad bikes are kept. That area there, uh, there are some lovely photographs of cattle being rounded up in that area. So those buildings have been incorporated into that workshop area on the island, um, just where the generators are uh, located. Hopefully that answers that question. We've done our best, certainly. Well, hopefully that has answered the question, yeah. <laughs> Any buildings I can, I can suggest. Okay, uh, so Brian, I hope, I hope that's answered your question. Um, let's move on to Tim Hambley's question. Tim is asking, uh, do we know what the maximum population of the island would have been and roughly when? All right, the maximum population ever of Lundy Island was during that period of the quarrying around the 1860s. I think it was Michael Bellamy out here, was it about 300, something like that? There was a significant quantity of men living on Lundy with their families. I think, I think they were saying that there were about 200 people working the quarries. So yeah. I think with the other islanders, it would have certainly been well over 200. Yeah. Whether it reached 300, I'm not sure. But uh... it's, it's, it's a fair size and it's to do with the quarrying industry. That's, that was the biggest population uh, in Lundy's history, without doubt. 
Yes, I mean, I suppose with the quarrying, what you can see now is uh, there's a very limited amount of uh, buildings that you can still see uh, in, in ruins, whereas actually there would have been considerably, uh, there would have been quite a number of other buildings all around that whole quarry area where, where the quarrymen would have been um, living. There were certainly two rows of buildings. As you go through uh, the quarter wall, uh, where the ponies quite often are, are huddled up there, aren't they? You go through the big splashy puddle at quarter wall. And as you start to creep to the right, uh, look on your left hand side and you've got the, uh, the foundations of quarter wall cottages there. And as you go further around in the distance over to your right on the coast, you've got uh, Bellevue cottages. And there was another row of cottages as well with a ruin of a well looking up towards the old hospital. Uh, so there were quite a few buildings up there in those days. Nothing is wasted on Lundy, even now nothing is wasted. And so the building materials were used up for other buildings on the island after the, the era of the quarrying. Yes, if you know where to look, you can just about trace the foundations of some of these buildings, can't you? That's right. Whenever I do my guided walks there, I always pause there uh, just to gather people together, have a, have a look at Boris and um, point out the, the, the ruins there. Um, and there's quite often ponies there as well, so it's always nice to see the ponies. And by Boris, you, you mean the Highland cow? I, 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 I'll, I'll, yeah, absolutely. No, no <laughs> <laughs> Just clarifying. Correct answer. <laughs> well done. <laughs> A uh, question from Leslie McLean. Hello, Simon. Is it true that a number of horses died dragging the marker stones to the road because there was a misunderstanding about the size? OK. Uh, it has always upset me. It, it, it is an upsetting story. It's anecdotal. I have never seen any documentary evidence. It's anecdotal. It's something that's been passed down through uh, time. Um, and you know what stories are like when they're passed down through time. The story goes that when the marker stones were put there, uh, they were put there by Trinity House. That road now is a very clear visible road. It never used to be. It was a, basically a path and they had to have it marked out properly in times of mist. The intention was to have one foot cubic boulders, uh, but the guy who put them there wasn't quite numerate enough and he did about one cubic yard, which is uh, 29 times bigger than a cubic foot. And so therefore that must have been a heck of a job for a horse to be doing. Uh, when you think that granite is a hundred weight a cubic foot, um, that turns into uh, more than a ton each boulder. So the story has promulgated um, and is still being used today uh, that a number of horses died. I'd like to think they didn't. Um, I'd like to think that anybody in that era would well look after their animals. I know in the mining industry, they were very well looked after. The Dartmoor ponies that I work with a, a lot on Dartmoor, of course, with, with pony heritage stuff. Uh, but I'd like to think they didn't. It's a legend. If it upsets you, put it out of your mind. It's just a legend, a story. Uh, we'll, stick, we'll stick with the, the horse and pony theme, although this is much more in the modern day. Uh, Steve Wing's been in touch. Uh, it's good to hear from you, Steve. Steve, nice uh, to hear from you. Steve says uh, the ponies were overwintered uh, in the late 70s and early 80s and Angie Bendel and Mary Gade and Steve would let them out every morning and bring them back each night. Yes, um, I, I went to see Angie Bendel. I saw her about two years ago um, up in Somerset at Minehead doing a talk. Lovely to see her. Um, and she provided quite a few photographs for, for the book that I did here and also my Lundy 50th book, uh, particularly of Bob, the late Bob, delightful guy. Uh, but yes, um, they certainly looked after them very well indeed uh, and always have done and quite rightly too. A few, few more messages of thanks and there's, there's an awful lot of people who are uh, planning to get to Lundy uh, later this year, which is Won't great to great. hear. Won't it be great? Uh, Gary, Gary Bridge is uh, looking forward to heading back in June. Uh, Mary Eggins is, uh, she and her dad are coming over in October and they can't wait. Uh, we've got uh, Sue and Jim Maguire, thanks for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Uh, Vic and Ed, thank you Simon, what an interesting talk. We're always happy to listen to your stories of Lundy. Uh, Sandra Rowland, thank you all for a great evening, Simon. Thanks Sandra. Uh, very informative uh, uh, and enjoyable. Thank you, Simon and Michael. So uh, that's uh, from John Paul Faramu. I'll, um, I'll, I'll echo that sentiment, Michael. Cheers for bailing me out this evening. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, 
let's uh, let's go back to the questions. Uh, Sarah Swindle asks, did the new jetty stop the need for using the west side of the island to get on, on and off the island in easterly storms? Sarah can remember getting off the island in the late 1980s from Jenny's Cove and it was pretty hair raising. Yes, wasn't it just? Um, I've got a cracking image in one of the books I did of Bob Bendel. We mentioned Angela Bendel, uh, of Bob rowing a boat over to Pyramid Rock. It was a bit hairy at those days. No, the Pyramid Rock landing on the west side stopped prior to the construction of the jetty. The jetty did not stop that. Um, I think that's probably the, the direct answer to the question. It was stopped a long time beforehand. It was recognised by Landmark Trust that really what was being done was a little bit too challenging. Um, and so it was stopped in the interest of, of safety. I mean, like Sarah, I can remember a couple of landings uh, that, that I've made on Lundy that they were in the, in the mid 1990s. But uh, yeah, I don't believe there's been a, a landing at Jenny's Cove for, for over 20 years now. I, that's, I'll, I'll go along with that entirely. I, I, yeah. And I've just, you know, a thank you from uh, Cathy Hall. Thanks so much indeed, Cathy. That's very kind of you. Uh, let's uh, go back to the questions. There's quite a few of them here. Um, oh, great. great. Uh, Esther White, thank you, Simon. I look forward to a Quaker led walk and talk on the island with you and Devon friends. Nice to hear from you, friend. Thank you. Cheers, Esther. Uh, Jacqueline Holt's got a question Has Castle Cottage? always been called Castle Cottage. Oh my goodness me, let me think really, really hard. Uh, was it ever called Telegraph Cottage? Um, I don't think so. I bet Alan would know, uh, but I don't think it ever has been called anything different than Castle Castle Keep Cottage, Castle Cottage. No, I, I, I think uh, the, you remember in your slide, you showed the, the smaller building, which is now yeah. forms the part of the bedroom, which was the original building. That's correct. That that was the signal hut. Yes. So so I think I think for as long as Castle Cottage has been in the form that we all know and recognise today, it has been called Castle Cottage. Yeah. But the the smaller part of it was the signal hut because it was the post office and where the signal cable came in. Ah, uh, there we are. Stephen Hubbard has just put up the Castle Cottage in the mid nineteen sixties. So yeah, thanks for that, Stephen. Um, I'll go along with that. Originally, like I explained, that's where the um, the telegraph signal cable from Croyd um, terminated uh, onto the island. Uh, please can I do another? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we've got plenty of plenty of plenty of uh, comments saying, uh, please can you do another another talk? Peter yes. Long says, wonderful window into Lundy's past, Simon. Uh, thank you for another super presentation. Uh, you say you have plenty more photographs. Hopefully you can take us for yet another trip into the island's past sometime. I'm sure if the situation lasts as long as it has done and you twist Michael's arm hard enough, he can twist my arm. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, Esther White again is, uh, with a question this time. Uh, why is it called Lundy Island? Okay. I think we're going to really get some battling going on here, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, Quakerly word, but... Lundy Island is tautology. Uh, Lundy is the Old Norse. Lund is the Old Norse for puffin. And uh, putting E-Y or E-Y-E on the end of anything means the island of. So therefore, Lund E-I was actually the island of puffins in the Old Nordic language. It was the Norse, not the Danes, that came around the bottom uh, that visited us there. And so it's called Lundy simply because it's puffin island. Uh, so if you call it Lundy Island, it's Puffin Island Island. There we are. It's to do with the puffins. Uh, I'm just looking at the chat here and somebody has said that they last landed at Jenny's in the early 2000s. And I'm ah, actually, right, sure. Liza, it's Liza Cole. So oh, yeah. Liza would know. Thanks for that, Liza. Very early 2000s, I should think. So therefore, in the time of the existence of the jetty. Thanks for putting us straight on yes, that. Yeah, in fact, Liza's suggesting that, 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 that the jetty was being built at the time. So um, that certainly, yeah. Just, yeah, certainly. right, you are. No, I have to say, I've, I've never landed there since the jetty's been built. Uh, okay, uh, I'm conscious of time as well. Hey, we've still got a number of questions to work through. So let's, uh, let's try and answer questions uh, on, on rapid fire. Um, let's do Jan Paul. Are there any photos of the widow's tenement? Uh, not that I know of that are particularly old, lots of new stuff, not, not of the, the buildings as well it, it, exactly, no, I've not seen of any old ones, no. 
Uh, Roger Starr asks, was there ever a police presence permanently? Wow. Um, I, in the last 10 days, have become aware that a police officer is alleged to have been appointed by one of the overlords of Lundy. I think it's going to, the answer is going to be watch this space. It's being investigated and researched as we speak, uh, but it would have been before 1856. That is when the Devon Constabulary arrived with my other hat on, um, and it is in the era of the parish constables. So we believe from the police history side of things, uh, there was a parish constable appointed with no authority from the vestry committee whatsoever, which should have been in presence. So as always in those days, London did what it blinking well did. So yes, there was a police officer on record there. Um, I've been there with my police uniform on back in the 1980s, uh, but I'm very conscious that had Mr. Harmon been there, I'd have probably got chucked off. Uh, thank you. Uh, we can't we can't let one of these talks pass without the mention of puffins. Uh, and Debbie Jenkin has got the question: When do the puffins arrive on Lundy? Right, Debbie. Nice to hear from you. Well, one of one of our guides on Dartmoor. The puffins are there. I've seen uh, the blog. Uh, Dean is the island resident warden, um, and he has seen three puffins. Uh, was it last week? I think I saw the blog. So they started coming back. Whenever I'm asked that quite general question, I always say about the 15th of May. Actually, it's now the 16th. Uh, so they're a week earlier than I expect. But puffins have been seen. I think by Grant. Um, some years ago in March time, very early uh, puffins. But yeah, May is the good time and they are back. So that's great news indeed. Let's hope their numbers continue to pick up. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dave Oddie. Uh, hello, Dave. Uh, Dave, ah, this, now this has fascinated me. So yes, Ooh. Dave asks, hi, Simon. Hi, Why are there six Trinity house stones at the north light and one at the bottom and five on the rocks on the left hand side of the steps as you go down? They are Trinity house boundary stones. Um, and that is the lease, well, sorry, the, the, the set area of the uh, ownership um, of under the auspices of Trinity house. And the top area um, has simply got more uh, than the bottom area. Uh, I know that Mr. Harmon was a bit annoyed uh, back in the 1940s when Trinity House erected a radio mast, the wrong side of those stones. Um, and he let it stay because he was a nice man, uh, but it was painted red and he wasn't very happy about that. No, so I don't know. I've never seen a document, document about it, but I'm, I'm aware of what you're talking about. Um, and they mark out the ownership uh, the freehold ownership of Trinity House of those areas uh, compared to the ownership of the overlord at that time. Thank you. OK, we've got a couple more questions uh, and then I'm going to, to start to, to wrap up. Uh, just a few more comments. Uh, Steve McCosland. Uh, Hello, Simon. Thanks for another super talk. And I look forward to hopefully catching up uh, with you again at some point this year. Thanks also, Michael mm -hmm. and David. Uh, thank yes, you for those fine words. Uh, there are plenty of other messages of thanks in the, in the chat, and I, I'm sorry I haven't if I haven't read yours out. There are just so many of them. <laughs> in that <laughs> case, we really... collectively say thank you, bless you for your interest. Yes, uh, Christopher Hoey, could you do another talk with current views of the old photos? Uh, yeah, Lundy through time um, does that, so I can certainly put that together with ease. Uh, before and after photographs, I guess he's talking about. Uh, yes, I think so. Yes. Yeah. Uh, consider yourself booked, Simon. That'll teach me. <laughs> I'll do that as the next one. I can put that together. Give me a few months and I can put it together. Um, Lundy before and after. There we are. Before and after. Uh, John, John Lovell. Hello, John. Uh, John's asking uh, what he says. Many thanks, Simon. Do you happen to have a Felix Gade family tree? As a friend of my late father was Guy Phipps Walker, who was MD of the Phipps Brewery in Northampton, and we believe he was Felix Gade's cousin. OK, I do not. Um, I wonder perhaps, I mean, the first person that I would ask is Alan. I know he's listening in. Um, perhaps Alan might be able to answer that, possibly. Um, and, and Sandra has. Um, uh, Sandra Rowland has uh, put a little message there saying she does. So there we are. Sandra, bless you. You've bailed me out of that question. I do not have a copy, but Sandra does. 
uh, perhaps if Alan sends me the the uh, the the, uh, the family tree and I'll, and I'll forward it on to John. Uh, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. yeah, John, if you want to drop me an email, uh, we can we can hopefully join this up. It's about sharing and communicating, isn't it? Uh, that's what it's about. Uh, and we're going to give the last question to Carol Lee. Hello, Carol. Uh, another names question. Where does blue bung for the old school come from? Okay. Carol gets the blue bit, but not the bung bit. Oh, well, I can I can do both if you wish. The blue, you've worked that out for yourself, haven't you? Uh, but the bung is, is the blue bungalow. Just, you just bung a low roof on it, don't you? So therefore, it had a low roof bung on it. It's now the blue bung. It's a bungalow. There we are. Short and sweet. Short and sweet. Brilliant. Well, OK, so I think uh, time for me to start to wrap up. Um, I'm going to do my usual promotion uh, of the Lundy Field Society. So I'm just going to share my screen again. Um, so, uh, of course, these talks are being put on with the support of the Lundy Field Society. And if you haven't joined yet, although I, I can't imagine there are that many people watching now who haven't joined, uh, please do join. The details are on the screen. Uh, membership is open to all and your subscriptions uh, directly support our conservation work on Lundy. Uh, you can also join through the website now. So we have a, a new uh, new functionality to enable you to join through the website. Uh, you can also find us on social media. Uh, there's an LFS Facebook page and a very active uh, Facebook group called Lundy Island. So do look those out. And it is the Lundy Island Facebook group where uh, I advertise these talks. And if you want to uh, watch this webinar again or catch up on any of the previous talks, they're all available online. If you just go to the address on the screen, uh, we've got a growing and varied selection, oops, uh, growing and varied selection of talks uh, covering so many aspects of Lundy's history and our natural history and also the conservation work that we do. Uh, and if you missed Simon's first talk uh, back in April last year, uh, you can catch up uh, online by going to that that address. Uh, remarkable thing about Simon's first talk is it's already been watched over 1300 times, which is just fantastic. Okay, so uh, my uh, usual reminder about the feedback survey. So uh, when, when, when you leave this Zoom session, you'll receive uh, a feedback survey. So please do fill that in. Um, really grateful for all the feedback that we get uh, after every webinar. I'm currently finalising the plans for the next webinar, which will be shortly after Easter, when Andrew will be, will be joining me to talk about bell ringing on Lundy. Uh, so details about how to join that will be posted on the Facebook group uh, and I'll send an email around to uh, LFS members. My thanks to Dave Richards uh, for hosting us again this evening. Uh, as we know, these events could not take place without uh, Dave's support. So, so thank you so much, Dave, for uh, looking after us uh, and hosting, hosting these talks. And thank you, Simon, for such a marvellous talk. So we've seen so many wonderful images of Lundy uh, in the past. It's been a really, really great evening. And, and as you've seen from the comments, uh, people have really enjoyed looking at them. Do you want to say your cheerios to the audience? Oh, actually, yeah. Thanks to you for, for, for bailing me out on the, with the IT. I'm conscious that there's a lot of my friends uh, from Dartmoor and elsewhere that are watched tonight. Uh, uh, thanks, everybody, for your interest, your comments. Uh, stay, keep the faith and look forward to seeing you on Lundy, hopefully this year and next year. All the very best. <laughs> Thank you, Simon. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that we'll have Simon back again at some point in the future. So uh, uh, do look out for Simon's third talk. But that's it. Uh, thank you all for watching. Uh, and I hope you can join me for the next webinar in a few weeks time. Bye bye. <laughs>